2 Corinthians, verse, chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. And last Sunday morning, we left off with Satan. His desire is to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped. And in fact, he has all over the world. Revelation 13, 4, they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who's like unto the beast, who's able to make war with him? Can you think of a story in the Bible where they worshipped a beast. A story in the Bible where they worshipped base of Mount Sinai. They made a golden calf. And these be thy gods, is what Aaron said. So they worshipped a beast. So that's been going back, uh, that's going back thousands of years ago. That's been going on for a long, long time. Romans 125 has changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God gave me something uh, this week. And I've got it uh, in my notes. I, I'm thinking about teaching it in um, uh, Delphi, Indiana this week. That's where we'll be Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. And, um, but it's about how people how people are deceived when you know I, I always thought about like Roman Catholic priests um, who are very well educated they're very well educated and there are some of them who serve as apologists for the Catholic faith they and what that means is apologetics is the study of this is why we do what we do and why we believe what we believe and here's the proof of it and they give all these proofs for worshiping Mary and they really believe that how is it that it is so hard to witness to someone of the truth who is let's say a Roman Catholic or a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or any of these other people how is it that you just, it just seems like you can't get through to them? There's a difference between thinking and knowing something here and knowing it here. And there's actually places in the Bible where God shows what goes on in their heart is why they believe certain things. There's something in here. When, when we say that we believe the Lord with all of our heart it's it's in our heart and once it's there it's it's like it's not going anywhere uh, I don't just when when God came to me that one day and said to my heart Mike this Bible's right and everything it says I accepted it I didn't have the knowledge of it I had the heart belief of it then God gave me facts, God gave me evidence, God gave me proof that this Bible was in fact the true word of God, it had no errors in it, so I have the head knowledge and I can teach it, but I have the heart knowledge of it, it is in my heart where it's supposed to be, and once it's there, you just can't pry it out. You can reason with somebody, and maybe change their opinion about something, that happens every day. But to pull something out of somebody's heart and change their heart, that takes a work of God. Okay, it's what, and God either seals off the heart to where somebody's not going to change, or God changes their heart, and they now believe, they know it. I'll, ne I'll never, as long as I live, forget the testimony of a young lady who was at a, a Bible conference in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and... She was an exchange student from Germany and was sent to a little town in Oklahoma. 
And it just so happened the family that she was sent to, they didn't get along. Don't know why, but they just weren't getting along. And she'd come to school in tears every day. And her math teacher was a pastor of a, of a church, Bible-believing church. And she, you know, he would talk to her all the time, but, you know, about what's going on. And him and his wife talked, they prayed about it. They worked it out with the family, worked it out with the organization that does the exchange. And they said to the young lady, you can move into our house and live with us. But we have rules. We go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You go, you're going to have to go with us. I'm not telling you you have to believe what we believe, but you have to go. So she did. And she heard the gospel and she got saved. And she came to this meeting. And it was before she was sent back to Germany. But she testified. She said, in Germany, you know, the this, this state religion is Lutheran. And, but even at that, we, we are taught from birth that we were, that we evolved, we came from monkeys and this and that and the other. And she said, when I got saved, I just instantly believed Genesis 1. And I believe God created me in six, you know, on the sixth day. And I just don't believe evolution anymore. It, God had changed her to such an extent that it was in her heart. And she says, I can't wait to go back to Germany because I'm going to tell everybody I know that we didn't evolve. God created us. And I'm just, I was just marveled at this young lady who instantly didn't believe in evolution anymore. She just believed that God created us. And uh, that's what God does with a person's heart. So when they worship and serve the creature, when they change the truth of God into a lie, that's done in the heart of man. His brain reacts to it, but it's done in his heart. That's where his soul is. Of course, Second Thessalonians 2, who opposeth and exalteth himself above God or uh, above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we've been looking at, well, won't, there we go, worshiping the serpent. We touched on this last Sunday, the Egyptian uh, pharaohs, they worshiped the serpent God. We covered this last Sunday, Exodus chapter 7. Uh, in Africa, they worshipped Mamiwata, who is the serpent god or serpent goddess, or a goddess who is adorned with a serpent. Ophiuchus is um, uh, one of the constellations, and Ophiuchus means the serpent bearer. The one who bears, there's this constellation up in the sky, the 13th constellation you thought there was 12 there's actually 13 and uh, 12 normally but every now and then I don't know forgot how it works I talked about this years ago but there's a constellation called Ophiuchus and it literally means the one who bears the serpent or he's got the serpent in his heart or he has he's like the serpent god uh, the eastern people Japanese, Chinese, they worshipped dragons, they worshipped serpents. You have the Temple of the Feathered Serpent down in Mexico. Here's uh, in, in India, the Nagas were serpent gods. In, in Hindu religion, they have 33 million gods. That is a lot of gods to remember their name. Can you imagine praying and then have to say in the name of and then list off 33 million gods so you don't miss any. But they worshipped, here, here's what's interesting. They worship a serpent with seven heads. Dun, dun, dun. Where does that come from? That's right out of the Bible. They worship a serpent with seven heads. Uh, here's what I found. The original Celtic Groundhog Day. February the 2nd is, of course, the 33rd day of the year, okay? And before it was a groundhog, it was a serpent. And there is a Celtic poem that says, The serpent will come from the hole on the brown day of bride, though there should be three feet of snow on the surface of the ground. And I know it doesn't all rhyme, but, but anyway, before the groundhog came out of the ground and saw a shadow, they 
had it as the serpent coming out to display himself to see if there was going to be more winter or whatever. In Lithuania, this is the day of serpents, when serpents come from the forest to the house. And they worshipped these serpent deities. This was their, their part of their gods. When uh, the explorers and the pilgrims and the immigrants came in from Europe and they're moving westward, and they're clearing land for farming, and they're, ex they're setting up towns, and then they go exploring everywhere. Uh, of course, they would find caves, and they would find giant bones in them. No kidding. But they discovered this mound, like Cahokia over here. There's this huge mound over here. These Native American tribes were mound builders, especially in the Midwest, Ohio and Missouri, Illinois, places like that, they were mound builders. And there is a state park in Ohio where they have what's called the Serpent Mound and they have built into the top of this mound this huge serpent form that is swallowing an egg. And it's built along on, in the midst of an old crater. What causes craters? Okay, falling stars causes craters. Meteors crashing into the ground. Most of them that make it to the surface of the earth are usually that big. But every now and then you get an impact from a, from a meteor that leaves a very large crater and the site of the serpent mound is where a star fell at one time crashed into the earth, and that was their holy place. That's where they worshipped the serpent god uh, there at the Serpent Mound Crater. This is Chichen Itza. Somebody said that to me, and I thought they said chicken pizza. Chichen Itza in Mexico. There is a pyramid called Kukulkan. And I want you to notice, let's see if I can draw this on here. Right in here, on the summer solstice, usually June 21st, June 22nd, somewhere around in there, on this exact day, they designed this pyramid so that the, the steps of the pyramid and the sun shining on these steps at this corner make it look like a serpent is coming down from the heavens because down at the bottom here is a serpent or a dragon's mouth open. And so on the summer solstice, the shadow cast on here makes it look like the serpent is coming down from the heavens to the earth. On the winter solstice, it's the opposite. It looks like the serpent is ascending back up to the heavens. Think about Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. And so it seems like that their religion in worshiping the serpent matches what we see in the scriptures of what Satan's plan is. Though he be put out of heaven, he desires to ascend back up into heaven and to exalt himself above the stars of God, which are the angels, to sit in the mount of the congregation, which is Mount Zion in heaven, to sit there, which is God's throne place. That's where God's throne is in heaven, Mount Zion, in uh, heavenly Jerusalem. And then he says, I will be like the Most High. So, for some reason, as they worship this serpent in ancient Mexico, thousand years ago, or however long, long ago this was built, their worship of the serpent matched what the Bible says about the nature of Satan. Even the Jewish Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, their tree of life, which actually it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil because it combines opposites together. Light and darkness, yin and yang, positive and negative, male and female and so on. 
Uh, I'm not going to get into all of this, but there is a coiled serpent on, in this tree. What does that tell you? If you have a tree and it has a serpent in it, it's not the tree of life. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God had told the Israelites, and he had a good reason behind it. He told the Israelites, when you go into Canaan, don't learn their religion. Don't follow after their gods. Don't, don't, don't look at their images. Don't desire, don't inquire of them and don't learn their practices. God was trying to protect his people from worshiping Satan. Worshiping the devil, worshiping the serpent. He was trying to protect them from that. But he knew that they would eventually turn themselves over to that. And that's where they are to this very day. They are some of the most evil people in the entire world. And God loves them. And he's going to restore a remnant. He's going to save them. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, you can turn there. The Bible calls Satan the God of this world. Meaning that he is, even if there's multiple gods in certain places, Satan or the serpent is always the preeminent deity in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So you have, you're either going to have the image of a false god, usually a beast of some kind. The, the, Satan is a beast. He is a dragon. He is a serpent, a fiery flying serpent. He has a beast nature. So they worship and serve the creature more than the creator because that's what's in their heart. They believe not the gospel and Satan blinds their mind so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. And I like this. The image of God that we have is Jesus Christ. And the image of Jesus Christ that we have is this book right here. So if your image of God or Jesus the one that you draw in your mind, if it does not match what this book says about him, it's the wrong Jesus. It's the wrong God. So who is the image of God should shine unto them. Luke chapter 4. Turn, in fact, let's turn there. Because this is the devil trying to get control over Jesus. He is trying to seduce him as he seduced Eve. He, through his subtlety, he seduced Eve. She fell for it. He then comes to Jesus 40 days in the wilderness. He's got to be hungry. And so in Luke chapter 4, verse 5, the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, uh, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, I believe the, one of the other gospels says an exceeding high mountain. So to me, that says that it exceeded high. It was higher than high. It was in a position where Satan could show Jesus all the kingdoms, not just at, I think, at the present time, but I think past, present, future showed him everything. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time because they are in a higher plane, a higher dimension. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee. What does that tell you? It means he has it. God has granted it to him. The charismatic teaching of that is, is that God lost that power and Satan clutched it out of his hands and God is powerless until you release him. That's a lie. That's a stupid lie. God is still God. He's still all powerful. He only lets the devil have limited power. And Satan himself cannot do that which God does not allow him to do. So God is still in charge. But he says, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them. 
for that is delivered unto me. He didn't steal it. He didn't. Uh, their teaching is that Adam had the authority over the world and because Adam sinned, he lost it and it went to the devil and Adam must, in faith, give that power back to God because God apparently doesn't have that power. Um, I'll never forget the... There was a young girl that died. She was about 12 or 13 years old. She died of natural causes, died in her sleep. And they could not determine any cause of death. She just died. And uh, there was three different ministers preaching her funeral. Brother Jim Waymire was one of them. And he had a like a little altar call. And I think a couple people raised their hand that they wanted to be saved. But the, the, her mom had gone to three different churches. And she liked all the preachers. But they had a charismatic pastor there that said that the devil won the victory over this girl's life. God lost it. And boy, I just, I was, I was in the back room with Judy Huey, the piano player, and uh, I just about lost it back there. I thought, that's nuts. But that's what he said, and I think Brother Waymar, when he got up, I think he kind of corrected it for everybody. But even though Satan has the power of death, we know from the book of Job that he cannot take a life except it is granted to him by God. God is still in authority. So the devil is in essence offering God, who is Jesus, his own power. <laughs> he already has it. But he says, all this power will I give thee in the glory of them, for it is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. He wants, demands that worship. Falling down before Satan himself is what he was asking Jesus to do. I know Jesus apparently better than Satan does. Okay, I know he didn't, and I know that he never would, and I know that he never will. Amen. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, which, if I remember right, has been taken out of the new translations. Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. But he wants to be worshipped. Um, let, me, let me throw this in. Let me read these verses here because I got something I want to show you. There, the phrase, the devil, the devil, certain number of times. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Psalm 125, 5, as, as for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways. Remember, the sat Satan is crooked. The serpent is crooked. The Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity, but peace shall be upon Israel. Proverbs 2, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. Philippians 2, 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. I want you to notice the symbol up on the screen. Uh, this is the God Mercury and he's holding a caduceus in his hand, and it has two crooked or twisted serpents. That's a symbol for the medical field because it just so happens that the symbol of the crooked serpents matches what our DNA looks like when it's coiled up. It looks like two serpents. The phrase, the devil, is in the Bible 46 times. You have, your DNA is packaged in 46 chromosomes. Now, uh, which are paired up into 23 pairs. 23 is the number for death. All right, Genesis 23, Sarah dies. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 1, there are 23 things that if you do them, you're worthy of death. So 23 is the number for death. And the phrase, the devil, is mentioned 46 times. So it would be like death times two. Is there a second death? There's a second birth. There is a second death. So... The 46th time the phrase the devil is mentioned, it says, and the devil that deceives them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And the lake of fire, Revelation 21, 8, is the second death. So the devil is mentioned 46 times, 23 times 2, which is the second death, and he's thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. I like the Bible. Amen. I like the Bible. Now, how much power does Satan have? How much power does he have? Can he control uh, churches? Can he control governments? Can he control people? Can he and all his devils, what kind of control can they have in a person's life or in this world itself. In Acts chapter 26, verse 18, the Bible says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Think of Pharaoh as Satan. And Pharaoh has power over the Israelites. He has power over them. They are his servants. They are his slaves. They do what he tells them to do. He represents cruel authority. When we are lost, we are under the power of Satan. We do what he wants us to do. Remember, he is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. When we were lost... We did what Satan or devils told us to do. They would tempt us. They would lead us into temptation. They would lead us into sin. And we would jump for it. We would do it. Almost without fail, that's what we did. And he had power over us and over our flesh. When we came to God, we were turned from darkness we were turned from the power of Satan unto God. Just like you have Pharaoh holding power over the Israelites, 10 plagues, and Pharaoh gives up his power, gives it to, gives the Israelites to Moses. Moses leads them to God. God at Mount Sinai gives them 10 commandments. That is his dominion over his people Israel. So, when you are saved, you're taken from the power of Satan, and you're now under the power of God. So, as far as your life is concerned, your life, even at its worst, is under the power of God. Some would say, well, what about when Satan tempts us and we sin? Doesn't that mean that Satan still has power over us? There are times when you are tempted and God has given you power and you're saying, I'm not doing that today. Amen? That's not, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm staying away from that. But there are times when we still sin. Does that mean God lost power over us? No. God still has power. God allowed that so he could teach us something, so he could chasten us and show us. And eventually, as life goes on, Satan has less and less and less power over you. Aren't you glad? Okay. God still is in control of your life. What he doesn't want to happen, doesn't happen. It's that simple. 
but he allows certain things, just like parents, we will sometimes allow our children to disobey us if we know that they're going to do it, but in a limited way in order to teach them, mom and daddy's right. Don't jump on the bed. What's wrong with jumping on the bed? Jumping on the bed is fine. And you try to tell them, don't jump on the bed. Until finally, they fall. And then for about three seconds, it's funny. And then you're going to check on them to see if they're hurt. And then when you find out they're not really hurt that bad, now it's funny again. And you say, see, I told you, don't jump on the bed. That's why I told you, don't jump on the bed. But of course, our hearts are so wicked that we try to think of how we can jump on the bed without getting hurt, which doesn't work all that well, I found. Okay? But we are under the control of God. I look back on my life and I see clearly how God allowed things so he could train me, so he could teach me, so he could show me how right he is and how wicked my flesh is and how he just he uses that to train us uh job chapter one turn there we're going to see here in job chapter one and two we see the at least some of the extent of satan's power Job chapter 1. God said in verse 8, Unto Satan hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught or for nothing? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy what? Power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, even though Satan did not kill Job, he killed his children. Killed all of his children. God put that into the hands of Satan. And here's, that's my point that I mentioned a while ago. Satan's power is still under God's control and authority. God knew. Here's the difference between Satan and God. God knows all of the future, does he not? He knows everything about the future. Does Satan? Apparently not. I believe Satan has a limited ability to see future events. Limited. God's is unlimited. Satan is limited. He cannot see. He thinks that Job, when he's lost everything that he's got, that he's going to curse God. Satan apparently doesn't have the ability to see that far into the future. If he would have, he would not have done this, I, I assume. Satan did not see that in possessing Judas and having Jesus betrayed so that Jesus would hang on the cross, Satan did not see three days ahead, even though there was nothing, as far as the Bible's concerned, hidden from Satan. Surely he can read, but he doesn't believe. So even though you have all these prophecies in the Bible, about a third day and a happening and a third day and revive us and the third day somebody's going to rise again. Even though Jesus himself told his disciples exactly what would happen, they didn't see it and Satan didn't either. 
He may have heard it, but he didn't believe it. Because had he known that in crucifying Jesus, that he would rise again on the third day, thus destroying his power, had he known that, the Bible says he would have not have crucified the Lord. Okay? So, one of the things that we know about Satan is that he does not have the ability to see as far into the future as God does. Okay? Now, I'm going to... I'm going to hook in another train on this track here. Mankind is developing artificial intelligence. We are seeing glimpses of it. If you use the same web browser, like if you use Google Chrome, Google uses artificial intelligence. And that artificial intelligence analyzes constantly you. You. Microsoft does it. App, app, uh, Apple does it. Google does it. All the big companies do it. They analyze you. And I have literally had thoughts in my mind. And when I went to search Google for something that was in my mind, Google put up as I'm typing the first three letters of what I'm going to ask Google about, Google finishes the sentence for me. That's freaky. Okay? Google and their artificial intelligent machines are starting to increase their ability to see into the future. Scary. Okay? Here's what's going to happen, let's say, in the next 10 years, could be five years, okay? We're all using our phones for this and that and the other. Uh, on my phone now, when I get in the car at 7.20 in the morning, Apple knows where I'm going. My phone knows where I'm going. And I get a little pop-up that says it will take you 23 minutes to get to the church. Okay, it knows that and it does that when I get in the car in the afternoon, it says 22 minutes to get home. Now, I don't know why it takes longer to get here than it does to get home. But anyway, it says that and what and what it's doing is it has it knows me, but it also knows a lot about the traffic between here and there. It has analyzed the road system and used that to project into the future that I will be home in 22 minutes. So here's what's going to happen in a few years. You're going to get up one morning and your phone or whatever device we have then is going to say to you, um, as you're going to work, we're going to project a different path for you because we know that in an hour's time, the path that you normally take is going to be congested, even though it isn't right now. How will it know that? Because it's tapped in to everybody else who's getting up going to work, and it knows that all of these people are going to converge in a certain area, which is going to tie up traffic, and it's going to take you and send you in an alternate way so you can get to work quicker than you would have. What it's doing, it's projecting the future. It's looking into the future. It knows what everybody else is going to do, and it's saying that in an hour and a half, it would not surprise me if in five to ten years that it would be able to project the accident that's going to happen. The wreck that's going to take place. Okay? And I'm just... I, this is where artificial intelligence is going. It is getting smarter and smarter every day as it learns humans and learns their habits and learns their traits. It's learning you. And now everybody's putting these devices in their home. The Google device or the Apple device or the uh, Amazon device 
the Echo or whatever, they're putting these devices in their home and those devices are on 24 hours a day. They are listening and it's not that there's some, some nerd in a cubicle listening in to what's going on in your house. That's not what I'm afraid of. There aren't enough nerds at Apple to listen to everybody's house. But there is an AI system that can simultaneously listen to everybody's house. Yes, Mike. Yeah. It knows that. It's, it knows your habit. You, we are creatures of habit. And even though we don't recognize it, your wife does. <laughs> she knows you. But there is a, the artificial intelligence systems right now are learning us to the extent that it's able to tell our future in a way that's never been possible before. We didn't have this five years ago. And it's, it, it's, it's increasing. It's, free, it, it's like he said, every three days, he gets a notice on his phone telling him gas prices. Why? Because the AI knows that he's probably out of gas or getting close. Now they're wanting us to stick those things into our cars, and we're going to. Because what, they, what they're offering us to put those devices on our car, hook them into the little port where you've got a computer in your car that knows everything about your car, and they want us to put one of those things in. I will say, because i got a teenage boy that's going to get a car and a license in the next few years. When I was at Verizon, they sell a device for $10 a month. You stick that in a car, and it's going to tell you every place that it's going, how fast it's going, and where it is, and if it's in going faster than the posted speed limit, it's, we're going to know it. And I'm going, you see, what, when I grew up, when I left the house, I told mom I was leaving. When I got to the school, I had to take the, put a quarter in the phone and make a call home, say, Mom, I'm here, I'm safe, okay, bye. And then before I left, another quarter, Mom, I'm leaving, I'm coming home now, okay, see you in a... Now, no way, I'm sticking that thing in the car and I'm going to know where that boy is. You see, that's the sell-off. That's the trade-off. We get a benefit from this, but theirs is greater. Because, again, it's not some evil person that's doing this. It's an artificial intelligence system that is gaining power every day. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get ready. Get ready. Because a God is someone that you ask questions of. And get a, an, a higher intelligent answer than the one you would have come up with. That's what a God is. Okay? Um, these AI systems know how to beat us in every strategic game that there is. Chess, checkers, go... You name it. These are all war simulation games. And when they, in Revelation 13, they marveled at the beast saying, who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? Well, we're now in a situation, Cubby, where we can't beat the artificial intelligence computer at any strategy game that we have. We already know that we're going to lose the war. Okay? We already know that. We're going to lose that war because it has the ability to see what we can't see. Whew. Satan's power is about to increase. Amen? Like I say, he thinks Job can curse God, but he doesn't know the future. So, anyway, we'll, we'll pick it up next Sunday. What a world we live in. Amen? This Bible, but the good thing about it is, this Bible is going to be right. In, it already is. This Bible already sees the future. It sees all of it. It knows. Okay? 
Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for giving us. This is not artificial intelligence in this word. This is God's intelligence in this Bible. God, this Bible is wise. This Bible is right. And this Bible, Lord, sees where we're headed. Father, I pray, God, that you would always limit Satan's power over us. Do not let him have us. We don't want to go back. We want to serve you. You're a good God. The devil, though he offered us and gave us sin, the suffering consequences as a result of that, Father, was a price that we could not pay. But Father, you're a good God, and Father, we want to worship you and honor you in our lives and not give Satan any more power, Lord. We're tired of it. Help us, dear God, to defeat him. We know, Father, that we are going to bruise Satan under our feet shortly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Bless and honor your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.